Hi, guys, and welcome. This is Jen Gata Siciliano, artist, memoir writer, bipolar psychiatric survivor, and your host of Not As Crazy As You Think podcast, the place that offers an alternative perspective on mental illness, highlighting creativity, non-conventional healing, and breaking on through to the other side. If you are ready for a new narrative on the mental realm that celebrates crazy and cool without penalty, then Not As Crazy As You Think is for you. Hello, this is Jen Gata Siciliano, your host of Not As Crazy As You Think podcast. I am thrilled today to announce a very incredible guest. I actually met up with her at the New York City uh, PodFest, organizing podcasters from around New York City life. And I ran into her and she had so much interest, so many interesting things to say about her latest podcast experience called Bird Woman. I'd like to tell you a little bit about her. Uh, her name is Lynn Rogoff, and her work spans history, social causes, and culture. She works as a writer, director, producer, and professor. She has her MFA in theater directing from NYU School of the Arts. She was a Writers Guild of America East Foundation Fellow, dramatizing 20th century American icons in Love Ben, Love Emma, which was based on Emma Goldman and Dr. Ben Reitman. Lucille Lortel originally produced her play at the White Barn Theater in Westport, Connecticut. Rogoff won a Writers Guild of America nomination for No Maps on My Taps, capturing the Black tap dancer's contribution to American history. Rogoff directed the filmed concert performance at Small's Paradise, receiving two Emmy Awards and recently aired on Turner Classic Movies. Presently, Lynn works as an adjunct professor at the NYU Institute of Technology. She is currently producing a shape-shifting bird woman audio drama multi-episode series based on the Lewis and Clark Native American guide, Sacagawea. Bird Woman, a magical realism drama, discovers her supernatural shape-shifting powers as part woman and part eagle, fighting alongside the expeditioners. Sacagawea discovers her full powers and her true destiny on this voyage as Bird Woman. Lynn you are an incredible, accomplished artist on every level. I welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for coming aboard. Well, thank you for having me here. I'm really eager to learn about what you're doing and help you and talk about what we're doing. Well, I will say that when I heard you speak, I was very inspired because I, firstly, the I, I got a chance to listen. I listened to it twice. And you are planning on continuing with this, right? Because you right. right, you have like the first five episodes completed. So I would love to hear a little bit about how you were inspired to create this story. And uh, one of the things I, I want to, you know, point out is that we were told one thing about Sacagawea, right? That she died when she was young. And here it is, this um, a recorded history of Sacagawea living until she was 96. So is this like part of why you decided to reveal this and, and tell the real, the whole thing? Well, I got very interested years ago in American history and American culture. And I started uh, work in various mediums on that. And one thing or another led me to Sacagawea as part of our group of young people in American history who did heroic deeds when they were children, when they were young. Right. And Sacagawea actually went on this expedition when she was 16. Mm. So 16 in the uh, 19th century was a, considered an adult. Yeah. They didn't have this concept called teenager. That's a 20th century construct. Mm -hmm. And um, so I uh, started work on her as originally as a screenplay and uh, wrote a screenplay. And uh, when I started doing the research, I discovered that uh, there was this conflict among the native 
tribes and the white historians that the native tribes believed she lived to be an old woman. And the white historians were basing their belief that she died at 22 based on a ferryman's journal that had been written at that time uh, in the 1860s. Well, no, it was the 18, um, mid 1800s that she had actually passed away right uh, after they took this ferry trip and uh, crossing the Mississippi River and uh, and then the Missouri River. And so uh, what happened was that there was a great deal of interest in the 19th century when um, it became interest in her during the centennial, which was the uh, 1903 to 1906 um celebration of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Mm. And at that time, the Congress, uh, the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs sent out a um, group of people to the Shoshone tribe that was living in the Rocky Mountains to find out what happened to her. Mm. And that when they interviewed these survivors of that period who were uh, maybe young children when she was an old woman all, and all had heard in this oral tradition that she actually came back and lived among them mm -hmm. to be a ripe old age of uh, 96 and that she was actually very instrumental in helping them negotiate treaties mm -hmm. and they had uh, Blacks and stones built for her up and they're still there. You can go visit these uh, stone uh, memo memo memorials to her mm. up on the mountaintop there. So this became uh, an interesting conflict between the two histories, yeah. one being an oral tradition and the other one being a f journal uh, that was written by a ferryman in 1812. So um, nobody has actually resolved it because nobody actually can prove one thing or the other. It's <laughs> amazing because like one of the things I, I noticed in looking through this stuff as well, like she has some kind of tombstone, right? And it's said that she died it's in Wyoming or something? Is that real? Yeah, that's where the Shoshone tribe is. Oh, so, okay. So, you know, this idea of it, that was, that tombstone was built during the centennial. Oh. And that's a hundred years after the expedition. Right. But uh, uh, there was an oral tradition among the tribal elders that she came, what happened was she was a member of this tribe living in the Rocky Mountains, what we now call the Rocky Mountains. And she was brought east by an, another tribe that had captured her mm. and uh, enslaved her. And this was quite common at that time is they would steal young girls primarily to increase their tribe. Mm. And um, so she was brought all the way east from the Rocky Mountains to end up in what is now North Dakota. Uh -huh. And she was living among the Mandans and had married, so-called married, a, a French-Canadian fur trapper. Mm. And his name was Charbonneau, and he was quite up, much older than her. Mm -hmm. He was 40, and she was... She was a teenager, and um, so he had a couple of wives. He liked Native American women, and, and, and many of the French-Canadian fur trappers would marry Native women because no women came from France right. with the French trappers. So uh, they formed relationships with the Native women.
Mm. And uh, so when Lewis and Clark found her and the chief recommended that they take her because she spoke the uh, language of the tribes in the mountains and uh, that she knew the way. Hmm. And because she had traveled one form or another, she had traveled either by horse or uh, but to come to South, what is called, and what is now North Dakota. So uh, they were very uh, reluctant to take her, needless to say, to take a woman, and yeah. she was pregnant. Yeah. And then they took the baby. She had the baby, and then they took the baby and her. But it turned out to be a sign of peaceful exploration to take her and a baby along. Right. And it said to all the native tribes they encountered that, this ex expedition was coming in peace. Right. And right. so uh, they did, nobody died as a result of war or uh, antagonisms. And they helped them, mm. they helped the expeditioners. All the tribes helped the uh, expeditioners as they traveled all the way to the Pacific Ocean mm. and then back again. And then so she came back to, with the uh, expedition, she ended up not staying with her tribe, even though they found the tribe in the mountaintop, which is a really incredible story. And they were starving up in the mountains because the Indian tribes were fighting each other. And, mm. and they were forcing her tribe up on the top of the mountain and they couldn't get buffalo to eat. And so they were starving. And they, um, so she, you have to listen to the series, but she ends up going back again west mm -hmm. and ends up back in her tribe after the expedition was finished. So there is this idea of the west as a place where only men mm -hmm. lived, you know, and were explorers and were uh, tra trappers and were... Um, you know, outlaws, and actually there were women traveling during that period. They're just not well documented. Right. So uh, the we don't really know that much about the women that were traveling in this area, and there's not that there's not much documentation. Right. Right. Well, I think it's interesting also that you explore that dynamic between the male energy and the female energy of the time. You know, there was that mistreatment. Definitely. She was really abused. Yeah. And I appreciated that. You know, you including that. It's not glamorized. No, right. No, it she has this she is she's suffering tremendous uh pain and abuse by her husband mm. of, of that time. And that's one of the interesting uh, dynamics that I'm exploring is how did she overcome this abuse and how did she end up being a figure that we're talking about 215 years later yeah. and be a respected elder. And I think traveling uh, with the expedition and seeing how valuable she was to them mm -hmm. and how um, much she could contribute to their health and their welfare and that she could actually make it. It was a 2000 mile journey, you know, we by boat, by walking, by horse in the freezing weather. Mm -hmm. And so she and the, all the expeditioners became very fond of her. Mm -hmm. And so they were very supportive of her and they would not allow her husband to abuse her. Mm -hmm. So she gained a lot of confidence mm -hmm. that she would not take the abuse anymore. That's amazing. Right. So she he's well known among the Native American community as an abusive man. Mm -hmm. And he he went on later on in life to keep on finding young girls to marry. Oh, this was a God. thing of his. <laughs> well, it is interesting because I remember, you know, hearing about her story and everything. And when I was young and it was so inspirational because it is it's really bizarre that this young woman did all of this 
kind of heavy lifting when it comes to right. the exploration, you know, and making this happen. So I love that you're giving her so much of a focus. I also want to bring up that the whole title, Bird Woman, is around, right. and you use magical realism, which is awesome because I'm that's my style of writing as well. So I, I definitely appreciate that. The idea that the animal spirits are are guiding us, you know, there's eagles that guide her, right? She's very associated with this bird energy. She's got the hawk that's telling her not to be afraid. Um, it feels, what I love about the magical realism element is that it feels so real. Like it gives it life, right? It breathes right. life. It right. feels right. true. Because she believes it, and and that's the spirit of of magical realism. So you really bring that to life. You know, I tried to show how it started, as she becomes more empowered by giving birth, by uh, being the only young woman, only woman on the expedition, and survive, keeping her child alive, and uh, through this horrific uh, experiences of blizzards and I don't know if you've ever seen the Rocky Mountains. I have. But right, they are not an easy thing to traverse. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so she becomes more empowered. And in the Shoshone language, her name means bird woman. Mm -hmm. And that's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. But my theory was that how did she get all this tr tremendous power and energy was that she had this shape-shifting or transforming experience where she got the power of her animal spirit. Yeah. And that's how she survived because she they were actually killing and eating the horses that they had acquired from the tribe to cross the Rocky Mountains. They were so starving. Oh, and she refused to eat the horses. Wow. Because in the native tradition, the horse is your friend. You don't go around mm -hmm. eating your horse yeah. or your dog. And uh, the men actually got a taste for it mm -hmm. because they were starving. And uh, so she, uh, as the series progresses and we're in the Rocky Mountains and she's starving, she and her child could starve as well. She, as a bird, as you know, the bird, if you know the predator, the eagle is a carnivorous animal. Mm. It eats meat. And so she, as the bird woman, feeds herself and her baby so that they do survive the winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we moved for towards the Pacific Ocean, where they spent the winter, she uh, demands that they uh, she be able to see the a whale had beached itself on the uh, coast there, and she had never seen a whale. And they said, oh, you know, you can't come and you stay here where they were at the campsite. And she demanded, and this is in the Lewis and Clark journals that she mm. demanded. And as I researched the native uh, belief system, they believe their creation story is that they came from the oh, the the whale. Oh. And so she wanted to see the whale because that's where they believe they came from the ocean. They came from the water. Hmm. And uh, so in my story, she's actually able to go into the whale hmm. as bird woman. She flies in and uh, I tell the story of what happens there. So I... I'm using the bird woman as a, a concept of shape-shifting, transforming. As she grows more and more powerful, she is becomes more and more bird woman as opposed to Sacagawea. I think you do a great job with all that. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work. I know it is because I study a lot with like some Native American teachers and stuff. And I right. think that you're being very respectful and i think that you've captured what they would like to record 
you know, what they want as the history. And, and, and that's the other thing that I'm curious, like, do you have people of First Nations who have listened to this, this series and have remarked about them? During the bicentennial of the Lewis and Clark expedition, I, which was, they were starting to, the bicentennial was in 2003 to 2006, but in 1999, they started preparing for it. Mm. And so we went out to North Dakota to meet with the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial Conference, the planners. Hmm. And at that, that was on the North Dakota Mandan tribal um, reservation. Wow. And so we met a lot of the historians, tribal elders and native historians there. And that's when I became very interested in trying to write a documentary. I wrote a documentary idea as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put together a, a board of advisors. And I had a number of Native American elders and a Native American historians and regular historians of the West on my board. Wow. And so I met with... Um, and talked with there's you know the, the, there's a woman who has since retired but she was from the uh, University of Wyoming Native American Studies she ran that so there are uh, and then we were working with the Mandan tribal elder and he's since retired but uh, we stay in touch so each tribe feels very possessive over her. Yeah, yeah. So they it's uh each tribe wants you to tell a different story. Really? Yeah. It's slightly different, huh? It, it's slightly different. The Mandans <laughs> want, you know, they don't believe that she was Shoshone. They say she was ours, she was born here, she was never captured, even though the Lewis and Clark journals relay the story that's told them. Hmm. And so uh, we've been, uh, I've been meeting with one of the women who was the image of Sacagawea on the gold coin. Have you seen this? Yes. So she was used, her face was used for that gold oh, coin. Really? And so she, uh, so in order for us to work with the tribe, we would have to uh, and actually get there, the Shoshone people, tribal elders. We, you know, we will have to present the entire series to them. Right. And um, so, you know, right now we're in the midst of trying to find partners to, ra you know, raise funds so that we could finish this. And so that's what our major task is at the moment is yeah. we, we produced 45 minutes that is up on the internet right mm -hmm. now. And then we're in the midst of editing another 45 minutes with our sound designer and engineer. And then we have to produce the rest of the other three hours. Oh, wow. So, um, ah. So are you in the production? Well, right now I'm in post-production with the editor. And we were editing the second 45 minutes that we produced. We oh, recorded. Okay. So, you know, I had a, a number of actors record a number of scenes for me that span the entire series. And so it skips, the next 45 minutes skips around a bit. And what we're thinking we may do is use either one actor to tell everything or a couple of actors to tell everything or um, to, because it, what we, when we edited and recorded this, it was during the um, lockdown. Yeah. So we recorded everything remotely. Right. And then, uh, so that's we recorded with people all over the country. Well, that's very interesting because it doesn't sound like that. Right. They all sound like they're in the same room, right? They sound like they're in the same room. It's really well, really, really, really well done. Well, that took a lot of work. 
because yeah. every each actor uploaded their dialogue into wow. their own folder, and then we have to reconstruct sure the script based you know the scenes based on that you know following the script, and then we have to add the sound design, and then we have to feel like they're all in the same room. So uh, it's been a major task to figure out how to uh, complete this. And that's really where we're at right now is we want to finish the series. It's a big story, needless to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. It's a very big story. I, I think it's just so important, though, because, you know, not enough people, like, care, honestly, about preserving the, the narratives of the people of this land, you know, the first people of this land. And I think it's something that we need to try hard to do, not just automatically adopt, say, the white man's interpretation of everything. Right. There's so much that needs to um, be told in a narrative. And I think that the things that you bring in aren't necessarily the things that are always recorded in a white man's narrative. And I, you know what I'm saying? Like they are often looking at like, you know, historical conquests and, and things like that. The things that are, are, are brought to life are the stories that make the spirit of the journey so much more real right. and accessible, you know? And I, I, it's very unique. The Native Americans have really a beautiful spiritual system oh, yeah. of the way they see uh, life and the way they see their relationship with the planet and uh, the relationship with animals. Yes. And they are not part of the Judeo-Christian philosophy it's a animism where right. god is their god they call it the great spirit is in everything it's right. in the rocks it's in the animals it's in uh the moon and it's um you know the earth is your mother the uh sun is your father and mm -hmm. it's a very different relationship towards life right and it's a beautiful method of seeing what life is about and how creation and uh, uh, our, our place in creation. Right. And what we are supposed to be doing. What is the meaning of our life? What are we supposed to be doing to preserve life, to preserve nature? It all comes out of their spiritual creative uh creation theories you know right. how do how did the world come to be and how did they come to be and uh what is their role to make a life for themselves and their tribes right and you know again it's like so much of that history was lost and so when you preserve something like that even just this point of view, right? This beautiful point of view. The the message of the the original people of this land could help everyone because they they were here first with nature, we, right? I I say we came over. I mean, you know, my family came over. We're Italian and everything, so we came over at some point, you know, and and then experienced America. But the thing is, sometimes I feel like. Um, their point of view was completely destroyed and they were here with the understanding of what it was to be one with that nature. And they saw, and that's where these creation stories came about, right? Like, because they had this unique, um, this connection. So I, I just find what you're doing to be so important. And I'm very, very uh, happy that I came across this because I, I think it's very unique. I, I, I'm pretty sure knowing the kind of research that you did on this, you probably know that this is not, this was not really explored that much. Well, I'll tell you, you know, when we tried to do the Lewis and for the Bicentennial, we tried to raise money for the, from the National Endowment of the Humanities to do the story of Sacagawea for the Bicentennial. They instead gave the money to do the story of Lewis and Clark. Really? So that's why I put it away. 
Because oh. I really didn't think that they were interested in women's stories. They were interested. And this was, uh, we did the proposal, I guess, in 2003 or something like that. We sent it to them, 2000. I can't remember the exact year. But it was around that time. And then, yeah, it must have been around 2000. And because we were trying to get the material ready for the bicentennial. Mm. And they ended up giving money to doing a Lewis and Clark bicentennial documentary. And it was, uh. that's actually when I did heard about the Me Too movement and I heard about uh, audio drama. I said, well, maybe now, that's when I started rewriting this. And uh, I said, maybe now, because there's more interested in female protagonists, that we can get a story made with a female protagonist. And so I had to rewrite the whole thing as an audio drama. Wow. Because I had not re worked in audio previously. Mm. So my training was in telling the story with visual components. And when you're doing audio drama, you don't have the visual yeah. component. You have to tell everything through sound design and music and dialogue and how the dialogue advances the story. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that comes across. It's so highly produced. It's clearly, you know, a um, reflection of your background as a director, as a thespian, right? So you understand that to tell a story, you need like all these other components. And I love the sound in it, uh, you know, how you capture just the sound of water rushing and, you know, the, the, the birds and the, the drum beat underneath. I mean, it's so like, I just want to listen to it and it feels like I'm inside a movie. Well, the, you know, we really worked very hard. Mm -hmm. on, I felt that the bird component, because it's called bird woman and because she has got a relationship with the birds and they talk to her and that she talks to them and she becomes them that they have that they are a major component of the story yes from a sound design point of view and so uh and if you spend any time in nature they know they're always watching you mm. <laughs> So it's not that we're just bird watching. The birds are watching us yeah. as well. When we're around, they go away. Or when they see the food, they come. And if you leave them bird food, and they're always looking for mice and, you know, the predator animals, the hawks and the eagles are. So they're watching us from above. And so I wanted to... With magical realism, you don't have to tell a slice of life story. You're telling a, a heightened realism story, mm -hmm. and so uh, that was the f that was a lot of fun to try and uh, make the story uh, unfold through the sound design. Now, with since you had to, you know, it, it is a very unique challenge that you're up against trying to get all this done in, during lockdown, and there was so many sound components to this so when people were say recording themselves did they have like equipment did you set them up with studios in their locations well that's a good question <laughs> i had an intern her job was solely to teach the actors who uh had no experience with recording right uh to learn how to record and we did hire uh, a, a number of actors who had a recording booth in their home. Hmm. So, or who had, there are a number of actors who understand that this is a, a way to make a living. Yeah. And so they have, and they do make a living as voice actors. Right. And so they had the equipment. Hmm. And uh, the ones that didn't, we taught them how to go in a closet or go under blankets, and mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it was a it it was there definitely was a big learning curve for all of them. And then some of them went out and bought better equipment after the fact, and so and and some of them we had to redo mm -hmm. some of the sound because it really wasn't 
up to par. So you want you don't yeah. want to, you want everybody to sound like they're in the same room and mm-hmm. they with the same quality of voice. So you so, must have like a huge like a major sound master mastering uh uh a team member who's on the on your staff. So what we did was we put everything on the cloud and we gave and we organized the cloud so that each actor had their own fo- folder and for each scene and they had to upload their dialogue for each scene in each folder and we had to make sure that they actually were doing that <laughs> cuz they did not a lot of actors don't have that technical yeah, yeah. aptitude you know they haven't really spent time being uh, technically uh, proficient in you know, <laughs> cloud yeah. software right so um that took a lot of effort on our part. And then we had a really wonderful sound designer. And uh, he was just brilliant. And he brought, we we did a lot of searching for sound effects. And he found, a, there, are, there are sound effects um, libraries. Mm. But you have to, you know, find the sound that you like. Right. And uh, this, that works with. And then we had two composers, music composers. One was a, more of an orchestral sound. And the other one was a Native American actor who fell in love with our project, who does a chief camera wait for us. He's out in uh, Nevada and he um, recorded flute. Music. He wrote his own original Sacagawea flute recording for wow. us. Beautiful. So we got, re- you know, what happened is they fell in, pe- the actors fell in love with the project. Yes. And we, so we, it was a very blessed project in that sense, is that people loved the project mm-hmm. and the actors, Native American actors, loved it, who were even more familiar with the story than the non Native actors. Right. And because I came from the theater world originally, I could turn to my theater actors. And uh, NYU, I got a lot. Some of the actors who were graduates of the School of the Arts program to work on it. And then I had a colleague who she does the hawk, and uh, she's a tremendous voice actor. So you have to get actors who understand the voice. Yeah. And how do you manipulate the voice to how do you what does a bird talking sound like? Yeah. So, you know, she was great and she's still great doing that. So uh it's it's a you know a labor of love at this point. Uh we need to uh get you know, a distribution firm that and a marketing firm behind it who will put more resources into it at yeah. this point. Because yeah. right now, you know, we're doing it ourselves. And right. uh, uh, we had a meeting last week with a company who said that if I finish it, they will do the marketing and sales and distribution. But I have to finish it. So I was hoping to have somebody come along and help us finish it. Because needless to say, to do another three hours, or three and a half hours of recording, you, you, you know, in the, the performing arts is a collaborative art form. Yes, very true. And so you want to have that sense of collaboration, mm-hmm. that this is a team effort. Right. And uh, not one person doing it. I mean, we had the actors were really wonderful in helping us uh, do with the logic of the scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am trained because of my prior work in the theater to work on logic on that. The scenes are logically unfold that an act, when an actor says something, he's responding to the prior person's, a piece of dialogue and that the story is advancing in a logical manner. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and also the, the 
the Native Americans experience uh, this story differently than we, you know, we experience it. Right. So there's little sensitivities that were very important. You know, thing about touching your hair. Mm. And I had no idea about that. Mm -hmm. It uh, uh, happened to be that I was had one of the characters referred to the her hair, and she points out to me, we would nobody would ever touch my hair, mm -hmm. and I had no idea that the hair was such a spiritual element. Yeah, and so that was interesting for me to make that a scene, make yes. that part of a scene, yes. so that. Uh, because she's pregnant and he wants, you know, the bird fell in her hair. And and then it's a whole scene about how important the hair is. So little things like that are very important. And we took out the word squaw, that a squaw is considered a derogatory word mm. in Native American culture, that it was used to as a put down for women. Mm. So we took out the word squaw, little things like that, that you may not uh, know about. Right. And then, of course, in my research, uh, things that they didn't, that Native actors didn't even know. So, for example, they did not refer to the Rocky Mountains as the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. They called them the Shining Mountains. Oh. Hmm. Nice. And there was the, you know, the that's how they sort it. They with it, and that makes sense because if you've ever seen the Rocky Mountains, it has a lot of snow on it, mm -hmm. and it shines a lot. Mm -hmm. And then there's the dark side of the mountain. So they, and then they called. They didn't call the Pacific Ocean the Pacific Ocean. That's a white man's expression. They called it the salty, uh, salty waters. Mm. And uh, so that. You know, you have to learn how language not only was at that time, but that each culture has a different language system. Absolutely. You know, the they sense of time, for example, they measured time by the moon. How many mm. moons did it take to cross a, a mountain? Right. How many sleeps did it take to cross a mountain? It wasn't days. It wasn't months they didn't have that concept of months and uh they had the concept of moons and days mm -hmm. and uh, moons and sleeps so you want to learn as much as you can about the culture before you start writing something yeah. or even you know that you make sure that it's interesting and it's you know you the listener can understand it even though it, that's not the way they think of time or the mountains or the names it still makes sense also yeah the, the fact that uh, once again you're you're bringing that language in is teaching a different part of the story because that's part of their culture so like knowing how they perceived it and and um operated their lives around the way they you know, uh, referred to things. Right. It's, it, it's so important because that just shows their perceptions and, and, you know, their, the, the value systems that they had. Um, we lost so much of that. I really feel that you did a really incredible job in, in trying to capture the, all those things. I mean, I, maybe cause I am so, I have such admiration for Native American culture and it's led me out of my terrible times um, I feel that I, you know, I, at first I had asked you before I even listened to it, if you did have a background, cause I'm always curious if people do talk about, right. Uh, indigenous, you know, cultures, do they have a background because, but you took it as a, you know, I mean, you're a highly trained professional. You took it as this is the research that I need to do in order to make it as authentic as possible. And that shows. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. I really, uh, you. I appreciate that. Do you have coming back like all the same characters and everything? If you should get this funding? Can I get the actors to yeah. do the, re yeah, I'm sure I can. You know, I've been, in I stay in touch with them. Good. And uh, 
they're all over one the guy that did Lewis is in Texas and the guy that did Clark is in England <laughs> and Sacagawea the girl who did Sacagawea is here in New York so it's going to be another remote recording if we do it we would try to get all the people who are in New York to meet in a studio so that we they could yeah you could do that now but the people who are uh all over the planet here i had an assistant in italy <laughs> and oh so it was we just were using the fact that we were in lockdown to our advantage yes and so uh we could work with anybody anywhere and so uh i think we could get all of them back again uh and uh, we just need it's it's going to be harder to coordinate, believe it or not, because now we're no longer in lockdown. Yeah. When we were in lockdown, everybody was home. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> and it was easy to get everybody to work. And yeah. there, were, there was no other work. Right. 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 So now you have to coordinate. Well, when is she free and when is he free? And uh, that's what happens. People spread out over once their project is no longer um, happening. That's the nature of collaborative arts is that yes. people move on. Yes, true. Well, listen, I, I wish you the best of luck with it. I really do. I also want to ask you, since uh, I still have you for a few minutes, you know, the fact that you do have an uh, interest in history, obviously, and the fact that um, you got into game design, I think, is very interesting. Um, my son is a gamer, you know. I right. So it's like I I came across a lot of your stuff and people remarking about um, the say the the Pony Express writer, for instance, the multimedia game. Now you're trying to incorporate human values as part of the gaming, I guess, experience. Like, tell us a little bit about that. And what is the overall purpose of this gaming experience? Is it for an educational setting? So the first game, what happened was that I had developed a series called AmeriKids. And right. when I was working in television mm -hmm. and I was working in children's television, it started out in children, I started out in children's television. And then, I developed this series of kids in American history, and we developed, produced three scripts for ABC as weekend specials. And then and then ABC at that time was acquired by another company. And so the rights came back to me. So I had this whole pool of kids. I call them kids, but they're actually, you know, teenagers who uh, I had developed all these ideas and when I went out to Los Angeles to do another project, I was approached by Fox Television to write for Carmen San Diego. I said, What is Carmen? I had no idea what Carmen San Diego was at that time. Mm -hmm. So I went to the mall and I saw Carmen San Diego. They had uh, all these Carmen San Diego games. And so I said, Wow, I have a series. So I went back to school and I studied game design wow. and the business of gaming in UCLA. And I turned it into a proposal for um, a game series. And we won a grant from Oracle Corporation to develop a prototype. And then McGraw-Hill came in and said, you know, we they were at that time launching a new division called McGraw-Hill Home Interactive, which were trying to do edutainment products. This mm -hmm. was in the mid-90s. And so they retained our company to produce uh, the flagship product for their new division, which uh, so we just produced Pony Express Rider. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was on CD. It wasn't even, DVDs had not been invented yet. <laughs> so we had to do the whole thing on three CDs. Oh, wow. And uh, um, we did live action, what they call ultimated, on top of a graphic user background, graphic background, so that 
graphic back it's a graphic background with live actors wow and so um it was uh needless to say a very ambitious project and uh i have a technical background that i've been developing over the years and uh because I came from television and, you know, mm. in, in television, you have to be a good technician mm -hmm. and film, you have to be a technical. So and then I studied game design. And then so the idea was to try and do nonviolent games mm. and try mm. to uh, get the, as you say, the human component as part of the game and uh, not to try to do stories where people are killing each other mm -hmm. but uh where you as a game a gamer have to uh, advance the story and you find yourself in the middle of history and now recently in the last few years because i'm a professor at a university at new york we got a grant from them to produce another game uh, called In Danger, it's another series. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that. So the idea behind In Danger is that you uh, have to find and save uh, the anim the endangered animals. Oh my God, I love it. Around the planet. And then we did another version of the game where you have to find and capture the poachers. Oh, I love <laughs> So we have all these prototypes and iterations of the game. We did it on, we did a version on the PC. We did a version on mobile. We did a version on VR. Wow. And and then we just did a new version of the poacher game where you're in the savannah in Africa and you have to capture the poachers. <laughs> <laughs> So we're in the midst of trying to put together a team. Again, we have, to, you know, the team dissolved because, you know, we, uh, that's the nature of these short-term prototype teams. And uh, so we're trying to get a grant now from, uh, there's a couple of organizations that are interested in our project and we have to write a grant application. Mm. So when we started this in Danger series, it must have been in uh, 20, 2010 or something like that, they, you know, they didn't really understand that how endangered games was any, had it, anything to do with the green movement. And one venture capitalist because our company was called Green Kids Media. Mm. And he said, how does this have anything to do with green? Uh, <laughs> really? And I really, in the last few years, I think that there's been more awareness yeah. that there is an endangered problem. Yeah. And that the climate and the uh, global warming are causing the animals to... Uh, have a precipitous end yeah. unfortunately and it's getting worse and worse and uh i you know the game business really makes their money off of hardcore violence well i will tell you i mean my son is 16 he's not really into violent violent games he doesn't have that much of a thirst for them thank goodness but what i found and that's why i was interested in your approach and your point of view because what i found in the gaming industry is exactly what you said and and when i would go into these uh stores and i'd say well you know he's a little i mean he's a little older now but it, when i was looking for games for him when he was about 12 or something like that i'd say well don't you have anything that's like you know educational or this or that or story based or there were so few most of the things that they had there were all mature and that meant that most of these young men are playing these games. I'm thinking, like, who are you creating these games for? They're creating them for these young men, not young kids. So, right. you know, there's a whole, I feel personally, that there's this massive, like, untapped um, area of 
potential like new game ideas that you know like not everybody has a thirst for that i mean I, I guess when you get a little older you might gravitate towards that i don't know but i love that you're introducing these kinds of things onto the market this is hopefully going to potentially be something that will come up more often but from what i'm hearing from you it's not it's not like uh that's something that's always pushed well you know the industry when we started pony express in the 90s uh and we there was a market called the edutainment market and they had carmen san diego and they had a lot of other products uh barbie dolls and you know which i thought was ridiculous but <laughs> uh they had a whole business model where businesses thought they could make money off of what they called mixture of education and entertainment yeah. was called. Cool. Well, that whole business dissolved really because they said there's no money in this. Wow. And the real money is in the hardcore gamers, the war games, yeah. strategy games, the violent games. And so they dissolved a lot of those companies that were in the edutainment market. Wow. And so that is one reason why McGraw-Hill originally was going to do three of our games. And Sacagawea was one of them because I made her into a, into, into a game. Oh, wow. And then they decided to, they spent $75 million on launching a new division and they closed the entire division. What? They How took a $75 million loss oh. at that time. In 1997. Wow. They were suddenly finding themselves competing with, you know, these hardcore game businesses. And they had to be in the entertainment business. And they were used to being in the educational publishing business. Right. And what they call the white shoe business. That was very disappointing for us because yeah. we had spent months and a lot of money negotiating a gigantic inter intellectual property agreement hmm. with them. Um, and they had also acquired a license to my trademark name, Americans, which I had trademarked. So it was uh, a major uh, disappointment because we really, I mean, with the Pony Express was beautiful and they put a lot of money in it and it, we, uh, had a gigantic team creating it and there's still a fan base people still I still people watch I what I did was I had a young man make a a version of the game so that we could just upload it as a video oh cool on YouTube and nice there he there are there's a whole genre yeah of people that are interested in legacy games from that era. Yeah. And they review them. And they want, you know, this is a whole thing where you watch other people play the game. <laughs> yes. And so that's what he did for me. And so oh, if good. you want to see Pony Express on the internet, you can watch it. Oh, great. He recorded the whole thing for us. And so, because it's a big game. Yeah. What happens in Pony Express is that what another research project of mine I discovered was that during the Civil War, there was a group called the Knights of the Golden Circle, mm -hmm. which was a precursor to the Ku Klux Klan. Oh. And they were working for the Confederate ar Army and the Confederate government to uh, be a militia movement to go out west and destroy uh, all these uh, Federal Reserve. They had a, a mint out in, for example, they had a mint out in Nevada, and they tried to bomb that. And then they had another mint in San Francisco, and they tried to uh, destroy that. So th the Pony Express was not only a bunch of young mostly boys who were 
traveling and delivering mail, but they were delivering messages mm. for the government from one fort to the other. Wow. So they were very important in the Civil War. Yeah. And so uh, we, you tell you, the story of the war and the story of the Knights of the Golden Circle is told while you're beginning a Pony Express rider. Oh, cool. So that was uh, the trick in history, dramatizing history, is to make it exciting and yeah. interesting. Because it is exciting right. and interesting. History is wonderful if you get the you find the right story to tell. Yeah, absolutely. What you're doing in, in creating these worlds, okay, is allowing us to spend time there in an right. alternative space that's not often per you know, uh, explored. So I wish there were more people out there like you who were doing that kind of work. But for everyone who's listening, you know, definitely check out Lynn's uh, journey because she's had, you've had enormous uh, success in a lot of these areas. And I think that, you know, I, these are the kinds of alternative, I guess, stories and approaches to things that I wish there were more of. Um, when we're speaking, it's clear that it needs financial support. Right. Right. I mean, right. that's what it always boils down to. Sometimes I, I make, I, I feel that what they're saying isn't necessarily based on the truth of, of what people would enjoy. But maybe the stats so far have shown that violence sells more, you know? Um, well, it's easier to produce violence yeah. than to develop character right. and develop story. If you Violence is, you shoot me, I'm going to shoot you back. So uh, that's an immediate conflict. Yeah. And that's easy. Right. You know, it's easy to do. First of all, it's very easy to program yeah. violence. Shooting is one of the easiest programming <laughs> so uh and that we've brought up a whole generation of young men primarily who think that when they go out and they shoot somebody that it's similar to what's happening in their games when they're yes. shooting people and that just re restart and everything comes back to life well that's mm -hmm. not what happens in the real world right and so unfortunately the violence is permeating from the game world into the real world. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Yeah. And, good point. Uh, and so it's very sad to see. Uh, but, um, you know, the, they're so expensive. These things are so expensive to produce. Yeah. And so expensive to market. Right. And uh, distribute. And so you've got to have a business behind you that you can guarantee them that they're going to make their money back and then some. And how, so how do you do that? You know, yeah. how do you pro prove to a company that not only will we make you money, but you'll gain, you'll make more money off of your money. And so that, you know, if you're going into the, trying to raise money, that is the query that you get. That's yeah, how am I going to make back my money? Yeah, yeah. You have to work around it. You know, you have to. In this day and age, nowadays, with the internet, you can more easily produce what they call sizzle reels or demos and up upload them yourself, and uh, you can develop some kind of market share, a very small, mm -hmm. tiny market share, but. Uh, it's never going to be what Paramount Pictures or right. United Artists, they put as much money as they put into producing these products, they equal amount of money into marketing them. Right. So that's what people don't realize is that the marketing budgets are gigantic. Yeah. So that you've got to come up with enough money to both produce it and market it so that your product will make money back. <laughs> mm, my so, goodness. 
that's what um that's what the new business is like. You know, yeah. you can produce small podcasts, small audio dramas, and you'll have a small market. Mm-hmm. But how do you capture the big market? Right. And the the big market appears to be celebrity driven. Yes. I mean, you look at who's making all the big money in these uh, areas. It's these big celebrities. If you get right. a celebrity associated with your podcast, then or your audio drama, then the the companies are interested in your brand, your brand, because your brand is easier for them to market. Yeah, right. It may take a little while to get this backing and everything, but. I just feel that if the, if it was ever going to take off, uh, this is the time. I feel like um, people are much more receptive to this this kind of alternate. You know, they would say like a alternate history or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, and you know, going back even to like Bird Woman, um, just you know, I I just wish you the the best of luck in all these endeavors because uh, it's like you have interest in changing the way we do things and the way we, we view things and for the better. And, you know, I mean, I, I love that. And even with the gaming, I love the idea that, you know, and danger, it's a great idea. I mean, right. I, I love it. Well, you have to look, it's on the internet. If you go to our website, americans.com, you could see the, all the material that I'm talking about bird woman and danger and pony express. It's all up there. Lynn, tell us the um, address of your website. AmeriKids, A-M-E-R-I-K-I-D-S dot com. Your podcast is on all podcast locations, that's correct? Right. We're on Spotify and we're on uh, iHeart and Apple and YouTube. And how could people follow you if they're interested in seeing more of the developments? So you can follow us on YouTube, Bird Woman on YouTube. We made videos, what I call videograms of the audio drama so Mm. that you can have a visual mood creating presentation of what we're discussing in the audio. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for, because I come from the film industry and I wanted a visual component. So we made these videos. And so Spotify is now supporting video. Oh, are they? So, yeah, we just put it up on Spotify with the video and the YouTube has the video and the website has the YouTube videos. You can watch the visuals. And what we did with the visuals was I knew that there were a lot of painters Mm -hmm. in the uh, turn of the century, in Mm -hmm. the late 1800s, 1900, who were intent upon capturing the Native American experience because it was exotic it was beautiful and so they traveled out west and they spent years Mm -hmm. with the tribes painting them and there's a a half a dozen famous painters and so i took those paintings and i combined them with modern day digital art Mm -hmm. that there are a handful of pa- digital artists that like to paint modern day native experience. So we mix the two together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're nicely done. And I, I, yeah, I appreciate that as well. I mean, because a lot of the times the visual helps right. with uh, any kind of drum, dramatic, either way, go to YouTube or the podcast, any podcast location, you could check it out. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of it at some point all right well we're going to try and get it up as soon as possible we've edited a couple of more uh scenes and now we're working on the scene in the rocky mountains Awesome. awesome so that'll be interesting for people to hear about what happened up in the market when she found her brother that's a wonderful story well thank you lynn for producing it i'm thrilled that you were able to share this with everybody and um and really you know i i wish you the best of luck with this endeavor because it's i think it's important culturally for our american history i i feel that you know a lot of people would think that something that was written at the time is more valid than 
um, you know, something that was passed down at the time, you know, orally. Right. But that's not really the case. So I I love how you are giving that, you know, uh, a chance to be explored and for, for people to, to see that that's, you know, um, a different way to record history and it should be honored. Right. Exactly. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for the support. It was great speaking with you. Thanks for listening to Not As Crazy As You Think. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And remember, mental health is attainable for anyone, especially those labeled with mental illness. Until next time, peace out.